With our companies, we operate in fiercely competitive markets, and we want to stand out. We need to stand out from competition. This is especially important for startups. Once you have a great idea that has traction, how do you stay ahead of the curve? Hello, everyone. I'm Maria, and I am delighted to be here today at Slash to share some of what I've learned over the last 20 years about building a durable competitive advantage. I've had the privilege to lead teams in companies big and small, teams of all sizes, from 10 to 100 to over 1,000 while building and scaling products that drove tens of billions in revenue. And so when I was asked to give this talk about competitive advantage, I've had to reflect on all of the experiences that I had throughout my career so that I could share my playbook with you. It's true that economy, technology, culture have changed, and they will continue to change. But everything else being equal, right? Building superior products with high velocity is one of the best and most durable ways that can get you to be in a market leading position and keep you there. So how do you do that? Building great products can feel like catching lightning in a bottle. It's rare and it's unpredictable. You may stand in the right place at the right time and you catch something incredible, but it's not a strategy that you can bet on. To harness this type of power consistently, you need to be more than lucky. You need to build a power grid. This is the talent that you hire, the ways of working that you establish, and the tools and the tech that you use. All of these make up the foundation, the infrastructure for sustained success. And so with this type of grid, you don't rely on lightning to strike. You generate your own power again and again on demand. So people, ways of working, tools, and tech. These concepts are actually quite fundamental. And so over time, they became part of my playbook. And so in today's talk, I want to share with you some questions to ask and maybe changes to consider as part of this playbook as you build your own power grid and you train your teams to ship higher quality products with higher velocity. It all starts with people, always, and setting them up for success. So here, I would like you to consider a couple of things. One is how you structure and shape your product and technology teams, and then how do you move those, your talent through that structure and shape that you created? So in other words, how you hire, how you develop, and how you reward. The first question to ask here is, is your structure driving clarity? And is your shape, the shape of your organization, optimized for the type of outcomes that you want? So structure here is how you organize your people, and uh, shape is the composition of your talent. So here are the few things that I've learned are important to get right uh, when it comes to structure and shape. When you structure your product and technology teams, give teams autonomy and clear goals. Bring in senior ICs for all of those complex projects that you really need to move fast to resolution. And finally, optimize and maximize for IC doer capacity with a flat organization and, of course, healthy ratios. So let me give you a few examples on each of these. When it comes to structure, one mistake that I've seen is teams growing bottom up without actually aligning to the strategy and the North Star of your organization and your company. And so what happens is that that slows down your teams and actually becomes frustrating for the people in your organization. Here's one example of how I've addressed this in the past and actually most recently from Personio. So I, I organized teams into these rather durable product areas uh, that maximize autonomy and minimize dependencies. Each product area has a very clear set of leaders across product engineering and design, and those leaders go very deep and develop expertise in the area that they cover. 
right? So competitors, uh, customers, technologies, and business drivers. So today I have about 20 of such product areas at Personio, and they are very well structured to deliver on our three-year strategy and our goals. Now, once your team start to execute against your strategy, change will happen, right? Like, you will discover new opportunities, new dependencies will come up, obstacles. So you need to build in flexibility in your organizational structure so that making changes doesn't feel like a huge change for, for people in your teams. And so at Personio, what I do is I regroup these product areas into larger product units that enable my direct reports, this is under my direct reports, to act fast on these new opportunities and resolve those larger dependencies faster. All right, let's talk about shape. So a common mistake that I see in technical organizations is leaders undervaluing the role of senior ICs. You're going to have complex issues in your product strategy, in your tech, in your UX, Issues, if you don't resolve in a timely manner, they're going to end up blocking your entire teams. And some of us have had this experience. And so the role of those senior ICs is to tackle those type of issues. So at Personio, I have senior ICs um, think director level across all technical functions. And they act like a lighthouse, guiding their teams on these complex goals and initiatives. Now, the reason why there is a lack of senior ICs, more so than I expected in technical orgs, is because their career ladders link progression with management. And so with, when that happens, everyone wants to be a manager. It's a really bad incentive system, and it's quite unfortunate. So if your organization is set up in this way, I give you, I'm giving you advice on a couple of changes to consider. One is, have career tracks that go all the way up to the VP level, not just so for your managers, but also for your ICs across technical functions. And then make sure that your combans and your equity schemes are identical for both of those uh, tracks. The other elements of a healthy shape are things like spans of control, team composition, ratios, and you need to be incredibly intentional on these. I'll say one thing here is that bigger is not always better. Teams that are set up efficiently actually move much faster. And so make this a top of mind for you and your leaders. All right, let's talk about people and growth. This is how you hire, how you uh, develop and reward. So three things are important here. Vet for hard skills and mindset emphasize impact, and reward those who go above and beyond. So I'll give you an example on each of these. When it comes to hiring, uh, one mistake that I see is technical organizations hiring solely for hard skills, when in reality, mindset is equally important. Right? To thrive in a high-velocity organization, you need to have urgency, scrappy problem solving, um, just ownership mentality, and resilience. And so to gauge mindset, what I do is I ask questions that really help me understand the person in front of me, how they think, how they decide, you know, who they are as people. And so you really need to have a high bar here. Now, hard skills obviously is also, are also important. So for example, for product leaders, you want to look for uh, strategic chops and product sense. Can they pick the right problem to go after? Can they find the right solutions, right? You have to look for execution skills and their ability to just drive through complexity to get stuff done. Across technical functions, it comes down to a love of their craft. All right, so once you hire people, uh, your evaluation rubric is very important. And what do you emphasize? So here at Personio, as an example, we evaluate all technical talent against shipping impact, demonstrating functional mastery, and building capacity. And shipping impact is what we uh, emphasize the most, is, has the most weight when it comes to um, outstanding performance. And now, of course, you have to do well on all three 
to do well overall. And once you um, have your evaluation rubric, your performance management reinforces it. So you have to clearly communicate it and consistently. So at Bersonia, we have very tangible um, expectations by level and by function that we make publicly available. It's very clear what's expected, and we emphasize impact. Uh, your feedback loop and the speed of your feedback loop needs to be the same as the speed with which you reward um, and you want to adjust behaviors. So we have a performance review twice a year, and then we have check-ins in between. And then, of course, rewarding the right behaviors is key. Like, what do you want to see in your people? So I spend a lot of my time to make sure that our comp and our career progression, especially for top performance, is done really well. And I write a work, work stream to make sure we recognize the right behaviors. So it needs to be top of mind for you. OK, so we talked about structure, shape, and people and growth. These are often overlooked, uh, but are they, they are incredibly important for you to have a talented and motivated team that is set up to deliver high-quality products faster. So let's talk about ways of working now. Once you have the right team in place, how they get stuff done will determine your outcomes. So here, what I learned is important to nail are these four things. You want to know your customers deeply, not just at the beginning, but continuously. You want to, be, to empower your teams to be scrappy and fast in problem solving. You want to hold a high bar on craft, and you want to focus on results, not simply going through the motions. So let me briefly touch on each of these. Customer centricity has to be there. At this point, it's a given, right? But it has to be very deep and ongoing practice, right? Without continuous in-depth understanding of your customers' needs, motivations, jobs to be done, you're going to have costly rework that will slow your teams down. So here, I learned that two things are important that I would love for you to consider. One is, Make sure that customer centricity is a natural part of how your teams build new products. And two, for your existing products, and you know, we all have existing products, most of us do, you want to have a strong pulse on sentiment about those products from your customers as their preferences change and as competition evolves. So I'll give you a few examples of tools that you can use in practice to get to do each of these things. So one example here is um, at Versonio, we involve our customers in our creative process. So for every new product and every big idea, we get, gather groups of existing customers that represent uh, the people that we're trying to solve for. And we call these groups co-creation councils. Our teams work with them very frequently, often going back and forth, iterating as they build new products. Now, once your product is ready to start rolling out beyond the typical alpha, beta, and you know, GA phases and the product metrics like adoption, usage that you use, tracking customer sentiment is key. So at Personio, we use um, CSAT and PMF metrics to understand satisfaction and product value. And knowing these metrics for our teams and knowing what's behind them also helps them understand when a product is ready for the next rollout phase. And then lastly, for your existing customers, I recommend to track NPS. Yes, NPS is not an operational metric, but it does give you a trend over time, and it comes with valuable commentary. So the best thing that you can do is train your teams to look at that commentary, especially the detractor comments, understand the themes, and address them on their roadmaps. All right, so let's talk about now Scrappy and Fast. Scrappy is not about the quality of the products that you ship. That's a common misconception. Rather, it's about how your teams problem solve around obstacles and trade-offs. And here, what I learned um, is important to nail three things. It's important to move fast for dependencies, normalize escalations, and 
embed the culture of doing more with less in how things are done in your company. So let's start with dependencies. In interconnected products, and most products are interconnected nowadays, dependencies are a fact of life. No matter how well you structure your teams, you're going to have teams that depend on each other to ship impact. And so what you want is go through those as fast as possible. This is an example of guidance that I give to my engineering teams. I tell them that if you can get this done faster than trying to convince another team to do the work, just take action, do the work, unblock yourself, don't create a dependency. If you've done everything you can and there's still some work to be done, like say a few hours here and there by another team, ask for help immediately. Now, if it is a dependency that's much larger, let's say weeks of work by another team, you can just squeeze it in, plan deliberately. So at Personio, we have six-week sprints, and we make sure that we leave time for these uh, larger dependencies on critical projects so that we keep momentum. Another example of a dynamic that I've seen that surprised me um, that holds teams back is this tendency to try and resolve every conflict by consensus. This is a shadow attribute in organizations that have a very inclusive cultures, but where people just don't feel comfortable with conflict. And so when conflict comes up, they try to resolve it on the ground within the teams and try to find a compromise. But compromise is not the right solution in most cases for your business. And finding consensus and building consensus takes time. And it takes your teams away from building. And so what you want to do is train your teams to recognize when they are in situations like this so that they can escalate in a timely manner. And you need to normalize escalation. So it's OK in your culture. And teams feel encouraged to bring this to forums where you know, a decision can be made in minutes or hours instead of weeks and sometimes months. All right, let's talk about holding a high bar on craft. So there's two ways to think about craft. I talked about the importance of your people to love the craft of their work and being hands-on in execution as much as needed to deliver on that. The second way to think about craft is the quality of the products that you ship. Here, uh, two things are important to get right. You need to define your bar, your quality bar, intentionally. And you need to then reinforce it with the right rituals and incentives. So starting with defining your quality bar, make sure that you base it on your product strategy and your market context. Some of the rituals, once you have that, what's important then to really establish the right rituals along the product lifecycle. And some of those rituals are, the examples here are product reviews that I've used in the past uh, quite a bit. Now, across your uh, rituals and touch points, you want to have standard bearers. These are the people who you trust to hold the right bar in your engineering, in your design, in your product. These people hold the line, and holding the line sometimes is very hard. But it is how your teams grow and how they calibrate to your craft expectations. Lastly, don't confuse motion for progress. You've got to be focused on what really, truly moves the needle. So here, my advice to consider two things. One is really minimize process. Remember that process is a means to an end. And that end is driving results fast execution, high quality products. Everything else is overhead, and you really need to be ruthless in rooting that out. And two, it's very, very important to have clear goals, ambitious goals. So let me give you an example on, two of the, uh, on, on each of these. So one example of process is how your teams plan and how much time they spend on planning versus shipping. There's this desire for greater and greater predictability quarters ahead at the feature level, especially in B2B. But reacting to that with excessive planning is really a mistake, right? It, it, is cre it creates this 
false sense of precision for your customers, for your customer-facing teams. And it also, again, takes your teams away from building. So you have to have the right balance. Um, here's one example of how we've done this at Personia. So we issue strategic themes, the investments that we need to land for the next 6 to 12 months. And then our teams take that and they iterate um, and they ship continuously in six, to, in, in six weeks um, sprints. And so what it does, it really minimizes the time that your engineering people, your teams, and leaders spend in long planning sessions. Um, and it actually also builds trust because of these shorter planning and delivery cycles. All right, so goals. Goals exist for a reason, right? You can only go as high as you aim. But if your teams are always expected to hit on their goals, what are they going to do? They're going to naturally send back. And so I recommend to tackle this kind of dynamic by having two tiers of goals. Goals that are likely to be achieved, let's say at 80% likelihood, and then stretch goals, more difficult goals, at 50%, let's say, likelihood of achieving. OK, to recap, your ways of working and the incentives that you said around these are incredibly important, and they can really transform the quality and the speed of your execution. The last piece of the puzzle is tools and tech. Here I'm talking about all of those systems that enable work, your developer experience, your tech stack, your um, architecture, design systems, components. These can feel like religious debates often. And the decisions that you make here can really make a difference in how quickly and confidently your teams move. Tools drive culture, and so they really deserve your attention. And more specifically, pay attention to two things. Make sure that tools enable you to measure the right things at the right time, and they enable you to simplify and automate. So starting with measurement. You can all, you know, if you can't measure something, let's start there, you can't improve it. And uh, I learned that really well, and especially I learned a couple of things within that. One is, you got to invest in, in um, infrastructure to support the right measurement for your organization and do it proactively. And two, you, you really need to invest in literacy of your people and your teams to understand the key metrics that are really important for your products and your business. So I'll give you only one example here. How your teams are set up to test and iterate their ideas is actually a really good example of tools driving culture. To have a culture of experimentation, first and foremost, you have to invest in instrumentation, as basic as it is, to be part of your product development cycle. It can't be an afterthought. It will be too much of a cost if, if you do it that way. So I actually really love the tools, the experimentation tools we had at Meta that the engineers uh, built there. But for most companies out there, that's having a homegrown experimentation set up is not a practical option. Now, the good news is that there are actually players now that will do this for you. So at Personio, we use Statsig, which actually was founded by an ex-Facebooker, and I highly recommend them. The next thing that you need to nail is uh, simplicity and automation with your tools and tech the less time your people navigate a complex setup of tools and tech, the more time they have to create. And so here, the mistake that I've seen leaders make and teams make is that introducing more and more fragmentation. And that results in just unnecessary complexity that, again, slows teams down. So the simpler your tools, systems, and tech, the better it is free guiding principles that I use with my teams, abstract complexity as much as possible for your product teams. So for example, um, let's say when it comes to a technical framework, just pick one. You don't want every one of your teams to have a separate framework. Too much complexity. Remove friction 
as much as possible, especially for your engineering teams. Right? You have to ask yourself and your leaders, are you red, are you yellow or green? on things like developer experience and systems like data architecture and APIs. You have to remove friction from these so that your engineers move faster. And free, automate, automate, automate. So one example is teams that spend a lot of their time firefighting, they can't focus on the future. So you have to proactively invest in things like your CI-CD pipeline and automated testing and QA and solid local environments. All of these things are important. All right, so we covered people, ways of working, tools, and tech. If I sound passionate about these topics, it's because I spend a lot of my time thinking, talking, and applying this type of playbook, most recently at Personio. Yes, there's a lot of work to do still, but we have already seen quite an impact on our speed and velocity of execution. I've been with Personio now for two years. So let me share some stats with you. Over the last two years, our velocity, our deployments per day, increased by 9x, and our engineering velocity grew just by 15%. Time to launch a new product dropped from eight months to four months. We launched five new products over the last 18 months, and we became a truly multi-product platform. As a result, our revenue continued to grow fast, even though you know, in this more challenging uh, external environment. And more importantly, our customers are validating our direction. So I picked this couple of quotes from a recent customer event that I went to. The new UX is on another level. Your velocity is really shining through. We, we all want to hear feedback like this from our customers. Now, let me actually show you the product and let it speak for itself. So this is what it look, used to look like. And here where we are, more customizable, more intuitive, richer. Of course, this is going to change more right, going forward. But it is growth that we have uh, already seen, and we are proud of it. To close. Every overnight success is a multi-year journey. So keep at it. Resilience begets rewards. Velocity and craft compound over time. Holding the bar is hard work, but it's essential. And most importantly, it all starts with people. Remember that. And make sure that you build with people that you'd really have fun with. And with that, thank you, and good luck building your own power grid. <laughs>